Yes, my writing's all done. I've got a complete manuscript. It's the right length. It says everything I need. I've got the figures. I've got the abstract. I've got the title. What more could I need to do? Huh. I haven't edited anything yet. Ugh. I can only imagine what the text actually reads like now that I haven't looked at it for a month. Well, in today's episode, I'm going to share with you my top 10 tips to better and more effective editing. Stay tuned, PIs, because there's a little rant for you at the end. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss. Over the past several months, I've been working on a manuscript here on YouTube. You can go back and look at the previous 60 or so episodes to see its evolution. Recently, we've completed all of the text. All of the text is there in the manuscript. But <laughs> as I look back over the text, it looks a little bit like a Frankenstein's monster. There's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Maybe it doesn't quite flow that well. My process of writing is to get all the text down that I can without editing myself as I write. I've done very little editing as I've gone. The reason I do this is because I find that if I'm editing my text as I write, well, then I run into the problem of just constantly editing and wordsmithing every sentence, and I then don't get very far. For me, and I find for trainees that work with me and my collaborators, that it's most effective to get the text down and then to go back and do a lot of editing to clean things up. Like I said, it's a lot of editing. So what I want to share with you today are 10 tips that you can use to make your editing more effective. And, you know, if you follow these tips, what I think you'll find is that the next time you write a manuscript, that your writing will be even better. Tip number one, editing should be iterative. I find that when I'm editing the first time through or the first several times through, that uh, I make a lot of changes. Uh, there's a Cat Stevens song that was covered by Sheryl Crow and a number of others uh, from when I was in high school with Sheryl Crow called The First Cut is the Deepest. That is certainly true with writing. As I've been editing this manuscript, I've had that song <laughs> like just going through my head constantly. The first cut is the deepest. That's enough singing. Anyway, so know that initially you're going to make lots of changes. Your manuscript is not perfect. It is not ready to submit. It needs a lot of work still. I prefer to edit the text directly um, in the manuscript um, on a physical document. So I like to use my iPad. Um, I also like to print things off and have some physical, tangible thing that I can work with. I find that if I'm doing things electronically, like in a word processor, um, that I kind of lose sight of the overall thing. Uh, manuscript, and I, I easily get distracted, right? I go to the web, I go to other sections of the paper, um, I just get easily distracted. And so by having this kind of physical token of my writing that I can interact with, I find that I make much better edits and that the process goes much more smoothly. As I share with you what mine looks like um, here on my iPad, um, you'll see that I've got a variety of things highlighted for things I need to come back to. I've got things in red to stand out to me. Some people don't like red, so you know, use whatever color works. It's a nice contrast in color. Um, and then I've got a fair amount of text in here. One other thing that I do is I write, uh, as you saw when I was talking about inserting references, I like to leave in placeholders, um, kind of like what I have here uh, for this text, where I, I didn't exactly know the e, e. coli coordinates that I was referring to, so I put in XXX. Again, if I spent the time then to go back and find the coordinates, that would have like totally killed my momentum in writing. But now I can come back and I can, I can fill in those Xs, right? Uh, so there's a variety of those things that I need to fill in, uh, version numbers and things like that. As I go through the editing, the amount of editing I do will hopefully become less and less until I get to a point where it looks pretty clean and perhaps I've got a headache from looking at it so many times and I'm just like, eh, let's move on to something else. Tip number two, let it breathe. As I just said, sometimes I edit so many times and so many iterations that I got a headache and I'm just sick of looking at the thing, right? Well, a few episodes ago, I was talking about this also in terms of my analysis and letting the analysis breathe and giving it a chance to percolate and kind of ruminate on that uh, and to think about what the analysis actually says to make sure everything fits together. Well, if I put the manuscript to the side for a few days and then come back to it, uh, I'll read sentences and I'll be like, what the heck did that mean? So as an example, in my abstract, I noticed that I had a sentence right here in the middle that doesn't really add anything, doesn't really say anything, and I'm not exactly sure what that meant to say. I think that was supposed to be a statement summarizing all the results. But as I can already see, I'm going to be doing some other editing, 
Uh, this abstract, I think, was exactly 249 words, so one letter, one word underneath the limit. And so I could get rid of those, I don't know, seven or eight words and, and kind of perhaps free up the text a little bit in case I need to add things. But again, by giving the text some room to breathe, I see sentences in here that don't make any sense. Oftentimes what I'm looking for are subjects uh, where I am assuming that the reader knows what the subject of the verb is. Uh, but again, looking at it with fresh eyes, it's not quite clear what the subject of that sentence is. Tip number three, strengthen your sentences by putting the action up front. Again, looking at my abstract here, I see a sentence uh, right around here, right? For full length 16 sRNA gene sequences, there is an average blah, blah, blah of that gene, right? So where's the action? Where's the most important part, right? I think it's back here at the end, right? So there was an average of 0.6 ASVs per copy of the 16 sRNA gene for full length sequences, right? So the most important thing in that sentence is that as you find more uh, copies of the 16 s gene in a genome, you're gonna find more ASVs, right? And so I wanna move that up front in the sentence. Um, people talk about in journalism, don't bury the lead. Well, I think each sentence kind of has a lead. So don't bury the lead. Don't bury the important part at the end. Put the action up front. By the same token, um, I'm not a fan of saying, as figure one shows, blah, 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 blah. Like you're kind of just killing the momentum of the sentence when you say that. Say what the figure shows, and then at the end of the sentence, in parentheses, put figure one, right? So again, put the action up in front of the sentence, and that way your reader knows what's most important as they're reading through your document. Tip four, get your tenses right. <laughs> I know this is like elementary school. Uh, my kids are working on tenses as they're learning uh, writing skills themselves in elementary school and junior high. For most scientific writing, the tense should be past tense. The work that we did, we did in the past, right? Um, rarely, very rarely do you want something to be future tense. Future tense would be for things like, in the future we will do X, Y, and Z, or someone else should <laughs> X, Y, and Z, and that will be future tense. Sometimes we do use present tense, and that would be for kind of statements of fact, right? So like E. coli has seven copies of the 16S RNA gene, right? That is a, it, it's not in the past, right? E. coli used to have seven copies and now it has something else, but it does have seven copies. So as I look through my own document here, I find several cases where I botched the text. So for example, right about here, I say at the time of submission, this is the most current version of the database. Well, someone's gonna be reading this in the future past the time of submission, right? So I should say at the time of submission, this was the most current version of the database. And we can kind of go through that um, elsewhere. Again, the kind of two sentences later, the RNDB provides could instead say, well, at the time that I wrote this, it provided uh, downloadable versions. And again, going through the manuscript and thinking about when did this event occur? Did it happen in the past? Well, it should be in the past. Is this a generalizable fact? Uh, that should be uh, in the present tense. Up here in my intro, I do have an example of using present tense, right? So one, an example of both is seen in the comparison of Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis, where each genome has, present tense, five copies of the 16S RNA gene, okay? So again, most of the time, your tense should be in the past. If it's a statement of fact, it's usually present. Very, very rarely is it gonna be a future tense. Tip number five, vary your sentence length, but tend towards shorter sentences. It's very difficult to keep track of concepts, subjects, uh, the direct objects or indirect objects in long convoluted sentences. Maybe I'm just too simple, but I like short, punchy sentences. At the same time, if everything is a short, punchy sentence, then it becomes like, see Dick run, see Jane toss, right? Uh, and that's kind of too simple, right? Um, but as kind of a general principle, we're also looking for wordiness, and we don't want overly wordy sentences. Um, you know, so an example would be, in order to blah, 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 just say to, <laughs> right? In order to test this hypothesis, replace that with to test this hypothesis. There's no need for those extra words. An example here in my manuscript um, is here on page four at line 96. This makes it more challenging to attempt to fit a distance threshold, right? So I could just say, this makes it challenging to fit a distance threshold, or this makes it impossible to fit a distance threshold, right? I can remove um, four words and replace it with one. That's a win. Of course, as we're editing and making things more compact, 
we don't want to make it so compact that we again confuse the reader by dropping out useful information like what is the subject of the sentence. Tip number six, forget what Mrs. Shaw taught you in high school English. Mrs. Shaw was a dear woman. She was my sophomore year um, English high school teacher. Uh, she had sheep. Maybe that's part of the reason I have sheep. Who knows? But she was a great woman. But <laughs> what she taught me in writing probably didn't serve me super well uh, in the long term for scientific writing, right? So we don't want to be flowery with our languages. We don't want to use lots of adjectives. Uh, we don't want to change up our vocabulary. We want to be consistent. Uh, we want to be tight. Um, we are not writing the great American novel, right? I am not writing this great uh, prose um, that's flowing like poetry. I'm writing a scientific manuscript that should be direct and to the point. One of the big problems that I have, especially with my writing strategy of kind of writing in parts before I edit, is being consistent with my terminology. An example that I find in this manuscript um, is what am I calling the things that we split, that ASVs split genomes into, right? So in the title, <laughs> I say unit of inference. Further down, I say clusters. Elsewhere, I say bin, <laughs> right? Um, and, and on and on and on, right? And I've got unit of inference in the text as well. So um, I need to tighten that up and be consistent in my language. You might think, well, it needs to be more variety or it's gonna be boring. But instead of being boring uh, and, and lively, by using lots of different terms for the same thing, it becomes confusing. Because someone might read this and say, well, what's the difference between a unit of inference and a cluster or a bin? He's got these three different terms. So if I limit that to one term, that it's much clearer to my reader what I'm actually saying. So I'm not sure what I want to use. Do I want to use unit of inference, cluster, or bin? So what I did was I took this title and I gave it to my lab uh, in a Slack channel, as I did um, in the last episode when I was kind of testing different titles. And my lab came through with um, responses to these three titles that I wrote. And I find uh, that most of the people in the lab prefer example two, where I say clusters. And I think cluster is where it's at, because it's, it's clear that this is a cluster of sequences, related sequences. Uh, and I think that's what I'll go with. And I'll, I'll, I'll trust their judgment. Kelly in my lab gave a good comment that she likes clusters because we talk about clustering sequences into OTUs. So that title then with clusters has more of a nod to OTUs as the alternative to ASVs than the other options. And so she's right. I don't mention OTUs in uh, these three different titles. And so again, having clusters is more of a nod to having OTUs. And I think she's right. And I think the lab agreed with her. Uh, so we'll run with example two. Tip seven, enlist a friend to read your manuscript before you give it to a collaborator or your PI. When you do this, it's a two-way street. So first, tell your friend what you want help with. Are you looking for copy editing, where you want them to correct your grammar and your punctuation? Do they, you want them to tell you that you haven't italicized your bacterial names? Or are you looking for more structural information, right? There's no need doing copy editing if you still have questions about the structure of the manuscript. Um, if you're looking for the overall flow of the story, that's more of a structural question than copy editing. It's critical, critical, critical that you tell your friend and that you trust them and that you will not be hurt by any feedback they give you because your writing might suck, <laughs> right? My writing often sucks. This manuscript sucks in its current writing and that's why I have so many edits. We need to be professional about that. If you're asking somebody for help, you should be willing to take the help, okay? So tell them that you're willing to take any critique you give them, tell them you know it's rough, but you need their help to make it better. Now, friend, <laughs> I'm talking to you now, be honest with, your, with the person giving you the manuscript. You do them no favors, you give them no favors by handing them back a manuscript with minimal edits. They know the manuscript is bad. That's why they gave it to you for help. They did not give you the manuscript so that you could say, this is amazing. This should be published in like Cell Nature Science, right? No, they gave it to you because they need your help. Give them help. Not putting comments is not helpful. Fill that thing with comments and so that they can learn and they can do better. And they'll do the same thing for you when you give them a manuscript. Tip number eight, change things up a bit. 
I talked about letting your document breathe. Well, sometimes we don't have the, the time to let things breathe for weeks, right? And we kind of want to move this story along and get the thing submitted. So what can you do to help change things up a bit? Well, you can change the font, you can change the margins, you can change the font size. What that does psychologically is it allows you then to see phrases in different contexts. As you read a manuscript over and over again in the same format, you know where all the sentences are. You kind of memorize the structure of your manuscript. And then as you read, you gloss over different things. But by changing the font, the size, the orientation, the margins, those types of things, you now see the manuscript in a different light because those phrases um, aren't kind of um, locked down or anchored to the place you expected them in the manuscript. I've been writing my manuscript in R Markdown. Uh, it's written as a text file. Again, that's one of the things that helps me avoid uh, spending too much time on editing, especially things like bolding and italics. Um, it also gives me a lot of power um, and the ability to put R code and output directly into my text. Anyway, in this header, I can do a variety of things to change the format. So these two lines on lines nine and 10 are giving me a Helvetica or, or sans serif font. I can comment those out. Um, I could also make my font size 12 point. I can make my margin one and a half inches. And so then I can make my manuscript um, and we'll then see how that changes the appearance of the manuscript. So that again, what we're looking for is to see sentences in different places um, of the manuscript so that I, I don't gloss over that text when I edit it. So again, now we have a serif font. Um, we've got uh, wider margins, which kind of moves things around a little bit. Um, instead of being on like three fourths of a page, my abstract and important sections are now over a page. And again, I can then take this and edit it. And um, by using the different font and structure to the document, I can then see text anchored to different points in the manuscript to again, help me to see things with new eyes. And then before I submit, I'll go ahead and put it back to the format that I wanna put it in, uh, usually adhering to the recommendations of the instructions to authors for the journal I'm submitting to. So here's another question for you all. Um, if you're a trainee or a junior scientist, what's one thing that you wish your PI could do to help you write better and to make the editing process easier? Conversely, if you're a PI, what do you wish your trainees knew about writing, right? So what's something that you, if you could tell uh, people coming into your lab that you wanted them to know about writing, what's the tip that you would give them? Uh, and feel free to put all that information down in the comments below because maybe you know, we could accumulate these ideas and we could share them with people uh, and we could do another video to kind of summarize uh, people's ideas. And so if you're a PI and your trainees don't know this bit of information, why don't they? <laughs> tell them, tell them. And if you're a trainee and you wish your PI knew something, you might think of ways that you can constructively tell them what information you need uh, to improve your writing. We call that mentoring up, I believe, right? Okay, the final two tips are gonna be a little bit controversial, but stick with me. I think it's important. Tip number nine, don't use track changes. I know this is controversial. P most people will think, what the hell is Pat talking about? But really don't use track changes. I think, it's, I think it's a crutch and I do not think it helps anybody. So first of all, if you take things from your trainee's perspective um, and, and they get a document back that you have made all sorts of modifications on, say in a Microsoft Word document, what are they gonna do? right? Are they empowered to say, no, Pat's an idiot. I'm not going to change this. No, they're most likely going to just change everything um, and, and not learn a whole lot from that process. And they perhaps don't feel empowered to push back and say, hey, Pat, you know, I wrote this sentence this way because of X, Y, and Z. I mean, I hope they would, but the reality is probably that eh, they're not going to. The other thing uh, is that track changes then become a bit of a bulldozer, right? So I get your document, I put it into Microsoft Word, I start making all sorts of changes and then fire it back to you. Um, there isn't much give and take, there isn't much learning uh, inherent in that process. So I like to work on an iPad or on printed material, as I said earlier. And when I, when I do this, it really slows me down because I write by hand much slower than I type. And I, I don't wanna give my trainee a sea of red ink right? I don't want to give them a bazillion track changes. I also don't want to write the paper for them. I've got my own stuff to write. I've got my own things to do. Um, and I, you know, perhaps I can write the paper for them or do a lot of heavy copy editing for them on this paper, but what's that going to do for the next paper, right? Not much. So what my strategy is working with a trainee is that I will spend an hour working on the document and I'll start maybe 
um, at the title or the abstract and go as far as I can. Or maybe I'll start with the results section and kind of work outwards kind of in the process that I would write. And as I'm reading that, I'm not going to be so focused on the first couple iterations of the manuscript on copy editing or wording of things. I might you know, notice things and I'm going to leave comments more in the margins where I'll highlight examples and say, you know, you're using all sorts of tenses throughout here um, or you're burying the lead, like I said earlier, right? And I'll highlight examples and then I'll give it back to them after I've worked on it for like an hour and say, these are some things I noticed. Um, rework the manuscript with these things in mind and then give it back to me. And we'll do this give and take many times. Eventually, we do get to a point where we are ready to do copy editing and work on the wording. But again, doing the track changes is just, it's just a bulldozer, right? And it's not teaching the trainee anything about the writing process. By giving them comments and then asking them to see an example, see how I would fix the example, and then work on that through the rest of the manuscript, I think they learn a great deal. One of the other things that I just absolutely love doing, um, and a colleague of mine, Greg Dick at Michigan, told me about um, his postdoc mentor, I think it was Jill Banfield did this with him, I think I've got the story right, um, is that she would sit down side by side with people and literally write the manuscript with them. I don't, I think, I think this is true, <laughs> um, but I think it was a great role model um, that Jill would do that with people. And so what I like to do at least one time um, one, on one paper per trainee is to sit side by side with the trainee going through their draft and helping them to see the draft the way I see it. Um, I recall working with a former student, Alex Schubert, um, and I remember reading a sentence, maybe it was like the first sentence of the paper, and I read it out loud, and she started giggling, and she's like, I have no idea what that sentence means, right? And so again, seeing it in a different context or seeing it the way I see it um, helps you to write better. And what I find is that, yeah, I might spend 20 hours over the course of a couple of weeks sitting side by side with somebody, um, which is something I love doing. I love doing it. It takes a ton of time, but I love doing it. But the next paper that Alex wrote uh, was great, right? It was, it was so much better written because we had gone through that process. And so instead of seeing it as like a 20 hour time sink, it was an investment and it really paid rewards um, down the road in her future papers. And again, that's worked really well with my other trainees. So PIs, please take the time to work with your trainees to give them feedback on what they need to know to write better. Trainees, listen, right? Don't see that example sentence, fix that, and then like ignore the cases of that throughout the rest of the manuscript. Really take their training and what they're trying to give you to heart. Tip 10, now this is for the PIs, cover your ears, read the damn paper. Really, come on. One of the biggest complaints that most trainees have is that their PI will not read their paper. They have put so much effort into writing this paper and you can't spend an hour to give them initial feedback on your thoughts of the paper. You know what that tells them? It tells them that either you don't care or that you think it just sucks, right? And, and maybe it does suck, right? Um, hopefully you don't, hopefully you do care, but maybe it does suck, but they need to be told that in a nurturing way and letting things drag out for weeks just is not helpful, right? Um, it, it's just painful. Uh, my wife's uh, master's advisor named Steve Kresovich um, had a, a discipline where he would get the manuscript back to his trainees within a couple of days. And he said that exact uh, same thought to me. He said, Pat, you know, these trainees, they put in a lot of work to write the manuscript. It's the least I can do to edit and help them to write better. My name's going on that paper. Steve's name went on that paper. Let's make the paper better because they're doing us a great service and helping our career. It's the least we can do to make their careers better. So PIs, read the damn paper. Really? Put everything else to the side and work on that. If you can't get back to it in a couple of days, tell the, tell the author, you know, I've, I'm working on this grant proposal. I've got a crunch deadline. You know, I, I'm not going to be able to get to it this week, but I promise you I've got time in my calendar blocked out Monday morning to work on it for two hours, okay? Again, I think they appreciate that, but leaving them in limbo where they don't know the status of the paper, it, it's very harmful and it is just super frustrating to your trainees. So that's the PI. <laughs> Collaborators, please read the damn paper. So again, what I advise my trainee is that we will go through give and take. We'll get it to a point where we really like the look of the manuscript and we like the flow of things. I think it's ready to go, right? But because I don't know everything, and as a courtesy, um, all our co-authors should see the paper. Um, I then tell them, give it to the co-authors. But in the email, tell them that we think it's in pretty good shape, we want their feedback, and 
we know they're busy. So if they don't get back to us in the next 10 days or five days or some period of time, we're going to go ahead and submit it. But if they have comments or if they need more time, please let us know. So again, by giving them a period of time that you want the manuscript back by, they can plan their time around that. And if they don't get back to you, uh, even just to say, hey, I need another like week or two, um, then you're free to submit it, in my opinion. Okay. So, and, and that's another place where the PI should be able to step in and, you know, for like an important collaborator that's done some heavy lifting on the paper and say, hey, you know, Mary, um, you've done a lot of work on this manuscript. We submit it. We want to submit it, but we want your feedback first. Have you had a chance to look at it? And, and so again, the PI can step in, maybe throw around a little bit of muscle uh, to help move that collaborator around along if you really do want their feedback. All right, so those are my 10 tips. I'm sure I have more tips. Um, my lab knows that I have many, many Pat's pet peeves of writing, but I think these are the 10 most important tips that I see in my own writing, the writing of my trainees, and the overall editing process that I'd really encourage you to think about. So if you have other tips that you think are important for writing, or you know, if you don't think PI should be reading their papers in a timely manner, uh, go ahead and leave a comment below and we'll send the Twitter trolls to attack you. No, <laughs> but if you have other comments or feedback or ideas on what makes your editing and writing process better, please let us know down below in the comments. Uh, we all learn from hearing other people's experiences. You might not agree with my process, but I think there's a few things in here that you can hopefully take away to improve your own writing. All right, so as we go ahead, um, we're getting close to submitting this manuscript. And so in the next ish episode or two, uh, we're going to go ahead and submit the manuscript so I can show you the process and what it looks like uh, to submit the manuscript and to be finally done so you can lean back and say, ah, I am done writing uh, until you get the reviewers comments back and then you think they're just a bunch of idiots. Anyway, <laughs> uh, keep trying to work these ideas and concepts into your own writing and your own research practices. and practice that. Tell your friends about what we're doing here on these Code Club episodes, and we'll see you next time.